There we go. All right. So now we're recording this. And uh, so I want to welcome you guys to week seven of our Balance Burn Challenge. And I mean, you guys are just crushing it. I have had some of the most amazing conversations the last couple of weeks and looking at people's numbers and their, their journals and, and, and really getting to know you guys. And I'm just so super, super impressed um, with uh, the major the vast majority of you guys really staying focused on on that and tonight um, I, I, I maybe it is just so nice outside I literally just ran in from a, a run myself and hopped in the shower and sat down my poor dogs are thinking what the heck is going on because they want to go out or whatever but it was just too nice not to not to go run so it's understandable that people might have taken tonight to do that or at least do something besides sit inside with me but um, uh, but thank you guys for joining me. Um, at week seven, um, typically at this place, uh, people are really, really good with their numbers. If you're going to, to really grasp all of this and you're really going to put in the effort with it, uh, as Meredith and I were just talking about, you guys paid for this, you guys joined this challenge for a reason, and most of you are just sitting, just killing it every single week. And at week seven is really where you start to see people just kind of either jump right out of the gate and really get going and you're really comfortable with your numbers and you're comfortable with your program and you're, you're just ready to do this and, and, and really do some good work or things haven't gone as well as you planned or maybe life kind of got in the way and some other things happened. And at least right now by week seven, um, you're feeling kind of defeated and you've really fallen off of the wagon. And so last week, in week six, we talked a little bit about getting back on the wagon. We talked a little bit about um, what happens when you get a little sidestep or things things pop up in your life or you know, th unavoidable things like uh, family issues or work issues or travel and things like that. Um, but you guys are really doing a good job with it. And I um, probably more than anything really appreciate the fact that you're communicating with me and, and saying, hey, I'm going out of town this weekend or I've got a family emergency and I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to stick to my program and what do I need to do? And you know, it just, it makes me feel so proud when you guys, um, you, you got it. You understand that, that you might need help with that. And that you, you come back to me and ask me and, and I, I, by all means, never mind those kind of questions. And, and more, more importantly, um, you know, I want to be there to help if there's something wrong or something going, uh, in your family life that, that's causing some problems. Uh, I'm always there to listen. I, I, I'm, I may be a nutritionist and personal trainer, but I'm a, a compassionate person and I want to, want to help. Um, get through those things if I can. So I'm always here to help, and I, and I appreciate you guys using me for that. Um, and so tonight, we're, we're really going to dig into um, a couple of a different things. We're going to take a little sidestep away from nutrition and, and talk a little bit more about how exercise and um, working out really affects the body and how that can translate into an increase in metabolism and why that happens, and then how do you fuel the body and all these things that are changing because by this point in it, if you've been doing your balance burn classes three times a week and you've been doing another, maybe an active recovery day or a running day, or maybe you're doing even more than that, working out with the trainer or maybe you're um, paying Sean for some additional work um, and you guys are really crushing it. And because of that, your metabolism is beginning to change. And by this point in the period, you're definitely starting to see differences in your body. And so how does that happen? Why is it happening? And then how do you work through um, moving forward from that. So we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Not that it's not nutrition related. We're definitely going to talk about nutrition, but how the exercise affects your body and what we need to do um, to work around that. So I'm going to, uh, to get this um, presentation started here and that way we can move on. So here's tonight's, um, tonight's topic. So we're going to talk about exercise and metabolism and how they work together. Now it's, it's, it's basically one topic. It, it might sound like two, but it's one topic, exercise and metabolism, how they affect each other and how they work. And so um, I don't really have a great story uh, for, for things to change. You must change, except for uh, if you guys follow me on Facebook, um, I had a little run in with some people this morning and it really affected me um, personally because um, it just, you know, I, I spend some time in the morning with my partner. We walk to the Metro together um, just to kind of have a, a morning walk together and talk and get the day started and head back. And my morning was interrupted by a couple asking for directions and I'm just a nice guy. So I thought I would um, give directions to them and, and they became very rude when they, what they were looking for wasn't within the block that they were in. She was very upset that it was a 15 minute walk. And um, it started a conversation with me thinking about just how miserable um, this person was 
um, that coming here to our city to visit, um, and she was very negative to begin with. Her life is clearly not very, uh, not very healthy. They were both very overweight, and she was just miserable just getting to town and telling her that she was going to have to walk um, basically from DuPont Circle to Thomas Circle. Um, she was completely furious with me for no reason, and I thought, you know, this isn't, this has nothing to do with me. And it, all I kept thinking was, for things to change, she has to change. She's, she's got to make some changes. But um, there were some political comments that came into play that I just ignored and moved along with my day to diffuse the situation. But um, I thought about this when that happened because, boy, she sure needed to do some changing to to get where she's going. Um, all right, so tonight's agenda, we're going to review week six, nutrition, uh, sports nutrition and supplementation. It was a big topic, and man, you guys had some great questions with this one. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the questions and follow-up calls, and then dig into tonight's topic with exercise and metabolism, and then finish off with a um, last couple of little reviews and whatnot. So uh, when we talked about sports nutrition, um, we really dug really deep into the fact that sports nutrition is uh, is just understanding an advanced understanding of how nutritional needs are based on specific fitness goals or sports related goals and things like that. So not just your average nutrition stuff, but really basing your meal plans and your nutrition on uh, physical activity, a strenuous activity, or really building the body for a particular, uh, a particular reason. Um, knowing that all sports nutrition programs, not one size does not fit all. So it's not very simple. It's not nearly as easy as a basic meal plan calculating protein and carbs and, and calories. There's a lot of work that goes into building it. But more important than, than tracking in your typical day, I track, I track everything, but in order to work with a client who has some specific sports nutrition needs, when I say tracking is critical, I mean down to the very ounce of water that's going into their body day in and day out. Um, and clients have to, in order for me to take on a client who's a professional athlete or has some type of uh, goal that, that requires some specific nutri sports nutrition work, um, they have to prove to me that their tracking is impeccable or it's just a waste of time for me and for, and for their money. And so tracking, 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 it's why I teach that from the very beginning. You have to start with those baselines, the same things we did with the body fat, lean muscle mass, and hydration. You have to know calories in and calories out, and you have to know how much you're working out, meaning you need to wear a heart rate monitor. These things must be measurable and quantifiable. Um, the goals cannot just be to lose 10 pounds or to feel better. They must be something that we can measure and quantify um, using the, the information of what we put in and what we take out or what you give out um, to the body. There are three key components to a, a successful sports nutrition program. The first one is the implementation of the basic nutrition program. You have to have your basic nutrition program spot on. Um, if if a, a client doesn't know um, how much protein they're putting in their body because they're not tracking it, there is absolutely no way I can teach them or coach them through an advanced sports nutrition program when they don't already know what's happening in their body and, and what they're doing. Um, it's just a given. It must be coupled with a very comprehensive fitness routine. And these aren't just regular workouts. These are things that we will do customized work depending on what those needs are. You know, a sprinter uh, is very different from someone who's a bodybuilder, and so they require much different workout routines and programs. And then lastly, it must be uh, coupled with, um, with uh, uh, ample rest and recovery. Your body must recover um, and rest. I had a, a client, a brand new client I've been working with a few weeks. He emailed me today and, or texted me today and said, hey, I'm really, really stressed with work. I've been going to the gym all week. I'm just feeling kind of um, unmotivated and, and, and exhausted today, but I really don't want to slow down my momentum of going to the gym. And uh, he hasn't taken time to really rest and recover. And so my suggestion was that he needed to just skip the gym today and go home and, and do some meal prep and do some tracking and get his get everything else together. If he was that exhausted that he was considering it, then it meant he just hadn't been resting uh, and recovering enough. And so he didn't want to use that as an excuse or have that being built up as a, an opportunity that, that maybe he's starting to use being exhausted as an excuse for it. But you do have to recover, and that's a, a very important. So the basic nutrition program, just like you guys have already seen, uh, must include those things, those proteins, those carbs, fats, and calories, but then also supplementation. We dug deeper into supplementation. The comprehensive fitness program uh, must consider form and function. What are we planning to do and how are we going to do it um, determines uh, the form and the function um, and what your desired outcome is uh, really tells us how we have to progress through that program. Now, the difference between resistance training and cardio, we talked a little bit about those things. So cardio is a very short-term fat burn. 
Um, we're going to dig into this much more tonight. So I'm not going to, to, to go too deep in this because we're going to really talk about the difference in your body when you're doing cardio versus weight training. Um, it's a temporary increase in endorphins. There, it requires a full understanding of proper endurance fueling, which again, we'll talk about tonight, uh, versus resistance training, which gives you up, up to three days of fat burning. And we'll talk again more about that tonight. Um, but it also elevates those hormones that reduce stress. And so, um, you know, you can just have a better state of mind uh, while you're burning more fat and building lean muscle that increases your metabolism, which will lead us right into tonight's topic. Um, but then also a very comprehensive supplementation program must be implemented when you start resistance training to make sure that your, amp that your body is uh, amply um, sufficiently, um, uh, that the nutrients are sufficient to be able to have the body repair and recover correctly. And then the third component is our sleep, rest, and recovery. The average human body needs between seven to eight hours, seven to eight hours of full rest per day, recommended by most leading sleep specialists. The muscles need between 48 and 72 hours when they're stressed under normal circumstances to rest and repair for recovery. Um, although heavyweight training, so if I work with a, a heavier trainer uh, training program with a bodybuilder or fitness model, it may take up to six days for those muscles to repair themselves. And so you really have to be conscious about that. Make sure that they get enough recovery so that you don't um, burn that muscle out and not have it build itself to its potential. Uh, the body needs at least two hours post-exercise for the hormone levels and temperature to drop back into the normal ranges and the brain function to begin that sleep recovery stage. Um, basically, that means just don't go to the gym right before you go to bed because you're not going to get as restful as sleep until your body comes back down. Then we dug into su supplementation. What do you need to know first? There is an overabundance of information. There's tons of products out there. There's so much fad marketing in the supplement world. Um, don't be fooled by what's on the label or on the internet. These supplements are not regulated by the, well, I should say they aren't. Most are not regulated by the food and drugs. Uh, as food or drug, therefore the content of the packages um, can be can and can be um, uh, very inconsistent. It doesn't have to list everything that's in there all the time, and so it's very difficult sometimes to understand exactly what's in a supplement and whether it's um, you know whether it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, we also talked about that most supplements or a lot of supplements that uh, I see on the market, especially things that are new and improved, those are pre-trial drugs. They're actually drugs that have been uh, research some some research doctor has developed a drug that has some type of an effect and uh, either the drug that they were creating didn't have the desired outcome they were they were looking for but it showed side effects that could actually benefit the body uh, during sports and bodybuilding <coughs> industry and so one uh, one particular product uh, we talked about it was a, a, a drug that was used uh, in HIV clients uh, to help prevent muscle wasting <clears throat> and the doctor created the drug. It did not have all the intended uh, uses he was looking for. Um, and so he came back and decided to um, redo the drug a little bit and retest it. But in the process of doing all that, he, um, they, they, the, the manufacturer put that product out into the sports supplement industry, completely unregulated, unpackaged, just really had no information on it. Uh, but it did show signs of, for people who were eating properly and working out properly, it did show signs of increased muscle growth. And so there was some benefit to it, but this is a drug that we had no information on that people were using. And so once, um, once some information got out about it, um, the FDA actually uh, pulled that product from the market. And that happens a lot in, in supplement industry. Be very wary of improved formulas or the latest advanced products. There's really not a whole lot of advancements in anything. We already know what most supplements do. Um, they just maybe change a molecule or do something with it differently to make the absorption change and it really doesn't do anything different. In fact, most of the times it doesn't even work as effective as the original did. Um, but the basics never change. There are certain things that you put in your body and the results are gonna be the same, um, but having a foundation um, of your nutrition program and, and sticking to that is the very basic uh, and that never changes. You still have to maintain all that. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, asking the bodybuilder or the person that you see at the gym what they do and just understand that a lot of times someone who looks that way, someone who is a professional bodybuilder or someone who's extremely athletic and fit, they might not have gotten those results um, in methods that they're willing to disclose to you. So sometimes um, those clients will use performance enhancement drugs um, to get those desired results. They really won't tell you that because most everything like that is, is illegal, um, but they won't tell you those things. They're just going to tell you um, that they eat more protein and work out, and that's how they got there. And so just be very careful talking to people 
um, about their routine and what they're doing and, and understanding that a lot of times people who look the way you think you might want to look or that are extremely athletic and fit, um, they were either born that way or they've used um, things that maybe you wouldn't want to use. So just kind of use what they say with a grain of salt. Um, all right, so then the basic sports nutrition program might look like this. So we start off with our proteins. Uh, Dr. David Heber, um, who's the head of human nutrition at UCLA, considered the number one nutritionist in the world, says that a mixture of whey, casein, and soy isolate is the most um, most complete protein when it breaks down into the branched chain amino acids. And so that every program, sports nutrition program, must include all three of these um, because they aid in building lean muscle and speeding recovery. Uh, at this point, you must be on some type of multivitamin. Your food sources uh, do not have enough uh, micro, macronutrients, in, uh, micronutrients in them. And um, um, burning as much muscle and burning as much fuel as you do in the body, there's lots of free radicals and a lot of damage done to the body through this. And so multivitamin is imperative at this point to make sure that you're getting those in adequate amounts. Um, caffeine is also used at this point in a basic nutrition, sports nutrition program. And I'm not talking about coffee caffeine or, or, or anything like that. I'm talking about a, a, a caffeine supplement. Um, these are natural vasodilators, which means they increase um, the, they, they dilate the blood vessels, which increases the uh, blood flow and the oxygen carried by that blood through the body. And so this can help stimulate the muscle. It can also help in recovery, but it also gives you um, a nice little energy boost before you go into the gym. All right, so then if we want to increase our, our, our uh, performance from it, then we're going to be adding in what's called branched chain amino acids. Um, and BCAAs are, are critical um, to rebuilding muscles. In fact, the branched chain amino acids uh, include leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And these three are the essential building blocks of muscle. Your body must receive these uh, and have those in large quantities so that your m muscles can begin to rebuild. Um, they are the ones that, that are derived from proteins. That's why the whey, casein, and soy isolate are important. They're needed for repair, recovery, and reduce muscle breakdown. The suggested, um, uh, the suggested amount per day would be 5,000 milligrams. And the ratio, when you look on the bottle, should be two to one to one of two leucine, one isolu isoleucine, and one valine. Um, we are seeing some other new versions of this that are slightly different ratios, but as long as it's two, one, and one, um, you're getting enough. Um, they can be taken anytime throughout the day. Uh, preferably before, during, or after your workout to make sure they're in the body um, near or around the time that your muscles are breaking down in extreme situations where people are really working hard, building good, solid lean muscle and working. Um, we're including branched chain amino acids throughout the day in their routine. Um, all right, you're also going to need to include some type of fish oil. We talked about fish oils when we talked about fats and why they're healthy and why they're not healthy and some, some, some uh, concerns with them. Um, they have two essential fatty acids, EPA and DHA. These are the two things that are responsible for the anti-inflammatory properties in the body. These are what's going to help the muscles uh, reduce the inflammation in the muscles and in the tendons that are being used. Um, they reduce muscle soreness, <coughs> excuse me, which is very important <coughs> in a sports program because if your muscles are sore, it's hard to go back to the gym <coughs> or it's hard to go back and train the next day if your muscles are sore. And so if we can reduce the muscle soreness that it gets us back into our workout much quicker. Now, the American Heart Association recommends one gram per day, but in any, uh, any workout program, it takes about two grams per day to really get to that, um, muscle re that muscle soreness reduction place. And so we recommend using two grams per day of those. Um, L-carnitine, which is one of the oldest supplements that um, has been, was discovered many, many years ago or actually uh, researched many years ago. And L-carnitine is an amino acid. Uh, it's actually naturally found in the body and in a lot of food sources, but it was originally thought to be the fat burner. In fact, a uh, research scientist originally thought that this was the key to fat burning. If we increase L-carnitine in our diet, then our body would burn off fat. Um, that's not necessarily true. It does have some fat burning properties, but now it's recognized as the most important component of recovery. You're gonna find L-carnitine in just about every single product um, that has to do with bodybuilding or muscle, muscle retention or, or anything because it's largely, um, its main responsibility is that re it decreases the ammonia accumulation in muscle and increases the blood flow during exercise. And these two things together really do help uh, eliminate soreness. It helps keep the muscles uh, fluid and also increasing the blood flow during exercise really helps you um, get a better workout uh, and recovery starting faster. So L-carnitine is going to be just about in every supplement you find, and we recommend uh, two grams per day of that um, minimally if you're working out harder. It can go more. 
Now, a pre-workout, if we want to move into the pre-workouts, we talked about these a little bit. In fact, your, your nutrition plan has this information, but at this point, we definitely want to add caffeine, and it's also going to contain creatine. Now, I gave you guys a little bit of information about creatine. Your body already produces creatine. Um, it is uh, naturally produced. There are lots of concerns with creatine, but used under proper guidance, uh, creatine is one of the uh, more popular substances that we use in sports nutrition uh, because of its ability to pull extra water into the muscle and increase that muscle and give it more strength. And so it's a great product. Uh, the problem with it uh, is that people say, seem to think that they get a lot of energy and a lot of size from it but what they really get is the extra water that it pulls into the muscle. It's, it's still a desired effect. It pulls water into the muscle, but people go, gosh, look, I've gained like five pounds this past two weeks and I've just added creatine in it, which is the reason that so many people um, misunderstand its usage and they just go and start using creatine without really understanding it. They're really just gaining water weight. They're not necessarily gaining muscle. It's just the extra water pushing into the muscles. Comes in many different forms, the monohydrate, buffered, hydrochloride, and nitrate. Um, but the original monohydrate formula is still the best. It's no matter what research comes out, monohydrate is the easiest and the best. Uh, please also keep in mind that creatine uh, requires glucose um, to be, so that it can be uptaked into the bloodstream. If you do not have glucose in it or have glucose while you're consuming it and it just sits in the body, it's going to be filtered out by the liver and it's actually quite toxic to the liver in uh, large quantities. And so you wanna make sure that it has something to be able to be absorbed. Um, and I do see guys in the gym just take, take creatine out of the, and throw it in their mouth and swish it with water. And I'm thinking, first off, it tastes horrible, but now you're just wasting it. Um, nitric oxide, we've talked about nitric oxide um, a little bit before. Uh, it was discovered by uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, doctor by the name of Dr. Louis Ignaro. Um, and what nitric oxide does is it is also, again, another vasodilator. It increases the oxygen carried by the red blood cells in the body, and it is highly responsible for cell communication and signal transmission. So uh, Dr. Ignaro, I got to, to visit with him and hear him speak on this. Uh, he uses it a lot. He adds this product to his, his uh, everything he can drink uh, and really increases, uh, he believes, increases um, awareness. It increases your, your memory. It increases lots of things through your body. Um, and it, of course, it makes your, your blood vessels more pliable. And so the reason it's so, uh, so advanced right now is that really helps out uh, with strokes and heart attacks. And his products uh, that he created is actually one of the leading products added to people who have strokes. It was his, um, his research was based on stroke patients uh, going to sleep at night and waking up in the morning. Their blood vessels were constricted and they would have a, a stroke. And so this product he uses that he was originally using it at night to keep that from happening. That was what he won the Nobel prize in. Um, uh, so it's a great product uh, and you will find it in just about every single uh, pre-workout uh, program out there. Now, post-workout and recovery, a few things that, uh, that are, are must-haves in your post-workout. L-glutamine is one of the most abundant amino acids that you will find in the body and in the blood, uh, but it is main focus is, to, uh, is one of the building blocks of muscle fibers. Um, it stabilizes the stress response in muscles, which means um, as the muscle gets really stressed, it keeps it from getting too stressed and breaking down so much. So glutamine is really important. And probably the number one reason people will add glutamine is it very, very quickly reduces muscle soreness. And so in a very strenuous program, I will always add glutamine into my clients uh, in pretty large quantities if they're working out, and especially in the beginning, so that they're not so sore and they don't find themselves slacking off because they are sore. Some additional supplements that you might hear of, Taurine is amino acid. It's been used in lots of different products. Beta alanine reduces acid buildup in the muscles. D-ribose increases energy, so you'll find that in sometimes in uh, pre-workouts. Um, HMBs uh, reduce muscle breakdown. You'll see those in just about every single bodybuilding magazine. You'll find people talk about them. They're actually not very productive, um, but you see a lot of use of them. Um, arginine, another essential amino acid. This increases the nitric oxide production, so just about every time you will find nitric oxide, uh, in a product, in a pre-workout, you'll find arginine with it because it is um, it increases the production naturally in the body. Um, Tribulus, uh, a product, if any of the guys out there um, have been looking for ways to increase or naturally increase and to stimulate their testosterone secretion, and Tribulus uh, is a natural way to help stimulate that, and it supports the testosterone that you already have in your body and helps your body release it back into the bloodstream. Unfortunately, as we get older, gentlemen, um, our body about the age of 30 
28 to 35 stops pushing testosterone into the bloodstream. It doesn't stop making it. It just stops pushing it into the bloodstream. Um, and therefore that response uh, lowers and that decreases our muscle strength and also our ability to, to build muscle. And so um, tribulus will help re-stimulate that. Uh, CLAs, they reduce body fat. Now you'll find CLAs in lots and lots and lots of products that, re that uh, uh, talk about losing body fat. Um, it is a, a key component in most body fat works, um, but it is not the, uh, the magic cure. Uh, and ZMAs, um, they are essential minerals that, that, uh, that you'll find in, again, find in a lot of different, uh, pro a lot of different products. Now, I think, um, I think from there, yeah, our final notes, uh, don't do these sports nutrition products alone. Don't walk into a store and, and ask the, the kid behind the counter uh, what to do. It's just not a smart idea. Uh, you have to start with your basic nutrition foundation. Listen to your body. Understand what your body's doing. And just like your nutrition program, the supplementation is a long-term process. You cannot take a product and expect it to work immediately and see immediate results. It's something that you have to measure over time and give your body a time to really adapt to it. Um, more importantly for me, this is, this is my thing. Um, if I work with a client that is going to be on a, a very aggressive sports nutrition product program, um, you must be having regular blood work done to test kidney and liver function. These things can be very toxic to the kidneys and liver. Uh, and so we want to make sure that they're healthy. So have a good, a good relationship with your body. Last take home message. There is no magic pill or supplement that can fix a poor diet. And so don't think that any of those things on that list, you can just go and pick them up off the shelf and still eat um, outside of your meal plan and expect to get results. If your meal plan is there, then we can have these in there and you're gonna see better results. But without that, that meal plan uh, on, on point, no pill is gonna fix what you're doing, all right? So that's it for those things. I wanna talk a little bit about the questions you guys had. Now, um, the first question of dealing with our sports nutrition was clarifying calories and protein for exercise. Now, um, what happened was you guys had a little bit of confusion when we started talking about these is that, what, what do I need to do with my calories? Do I increase my calories? Do I increase protein? How does all that work? And so I want to clarify that really quickly. Your basic nutrition program was balanced for the amount of muscle you have. Those protein numbers never change until you redo your DEXA scans and find out that maybe you've gained 10 pounds of muscle. If you've gained three or four pounds of muscle, your protein needs are probably still about the same. If you've gained 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds of, of lean muscle, then we need to up your protein to fuel that muscle that you've now built. But beyond that, that number never changed. Calories, if you're doing your programming the way we had originally set them up and you're working out on, on doing your three-day-a-week balance burn classes and, and just your average workouts, then your calories should be pretty much set the same. The only time these things will change is if you decide, all right, now I'm ready to go do a lot more work and you're out doing a, you know, a 20 mile run on a Saturday and maybe you're doing a five mile run every morning and you're exerting your body more or going to play tennis in the afternoon plus working out, then your calories might change. And so that's where we need to look at carbohydrates and fats and increase those, the, the amount of energy that you're fueling your body so that you have the energy to do those workouts. That, that point is when we really want to look at your calories. Um, and so it's, if you are still within um, measuring your daily calorie consumption and what you're, what you're expending, if you're still within a three to 500 calorie range, either side of that number that we started with, then do not move your calories. How do I know if I need to change my program? When you start getting hungry all the time because you're working out or you start feeling tired because you're not eating enough, um, that's usually when we need to see uh, some changes. If you are following your nutrition program to the letter and you are still hungry, at different times of the day, or you're still not getting enough energy before you go into the gym, then we really need to look at how many calories you're burning and how that all works together. That's when we might change the program. But just because um, you've heard that you need to change your program periodically so that you can challenge the body a little bit, we're not there yet. You guys are seven weeks in. I suggest my clients go at least eight to 12 weeks on the same nutrition program and measure their changes before we do anything different. Do I need to change my protein sources? So I had a couple of you guys hear me last week and talk about all these different protein sources um, and what might, might need to, to change because you're working out more frequently. And so uh, if you are working out and, um, and you're challenging your body and you're really building good lean muscle, um, you need to look at your protein sources that you're taking in and know that if you're only consuming one type of protein, so if I've, I've got clients who are who are vegan, who are vegetarian, and they're only using soy protein as their main protein source. There are other protein, vegetarian proteins out there and vegan sources out there, but if you're only using one source and your body's only gonna get 
a certain number of those amino acids that it needs to rebuild those muscles. And so it's more uh, advantageous to you to have a variety of protein sources. And that's one of the reasons why I encourage you to eat seafood through the week um, and vary your protein. And then when you're using a protein supplement, making sure that you're using whey and casein and soy isolate um, and, and lots of others, other sources with pea, rice, and sesame proteins and, and whatnot. And so there are lots of protein sources. Um, I am always a pro proponent of using a variety of protein sources to make sure that your body's getting a good balance of those. All right, so then we went to the supplementation part. Um, a couple of you guys asked me, well, if I'm going to the store, I'm going to look at products. Is there a particular brand that is the best or maybe one that is um, uh, researched more or, you know, what do I suggest? Um, what I suggested in your meal plans are the ones that I always suggest. They're ones that I think are the highest quality. Um, they're tested over and over again. They've been around for a long time, so we know that they work. We know that they're good. Um, I'm always very cautious of the brand new company that's better, new, improved. It's mostly slick marketing. Um, and so I don't, I try to shy away, or I guess I do shy away from those because I don't really know that company. I'm uh, especially with a, uh, since their supplements are not regulated, I'm going to go with a company who's been around a long time and has proven that they're giving good results. Um, and that's usually my recommendation. So um, if you have other ones, a lot of you guys are sending me um, screenshots of the products that you've taken or things that you're adding in. And when I read through them, some of them are really good. Some of them are not. I usually have some suggestions with them. Um, in fact, last week, uh, someone sent me something and it was horrible. Um, and she thought it was horrible tasting, but the product itself just was nothing to it. So um, if you have questions, feel free to send them to me. I'll, I'll be glad to look at them. Um, how much is too much? Supplementations, there are recommendations on all the, can uh, can the canisters and the bottles, but can you overdose on a supplement? Because most people assume that a supplement is a natural product. I, I don't know why we always assume that a supplement is all natural. The supplement doesn't have to be natural. Remember we talked about supplements can also be drugs that are still not in, uh, not been approved or in trials that are out there that, that the manufacturers just sitting on the market out there. And so we don't really always know um, whether something's safe or not at large quantities. Uh, now there's a lot of research on most of the things that we've already talked about and we know how much you could use. Um, but I never, ever, ever, I'm not that person that says if one is good, then two is better. Um, I try to stay with what I have, especially if I'm tracking it. If I use one or if I, let's use milligrams, if I use 5,000 milligrams a day and I'm getting good results from it, I might test 8,000 milligrams one day or one, a couple of weeks. And if I'm getting better results there and I don't see any difference, then I'm okay with that. Um, but I also have my blood work done every three months, uh, like clockwork, and I check that. So I always know where I'm at. So just be very, very careful um, thinking that more, more is better because that might help me lose weight faster or might help me tone up a little quicker. Um, and then I had um, a really good conversation about something that uh, I actually am very, uh, very much a, a big, lots of detail with it. And that's a vitamin B study. Um, one of you guys sent me some a uh, question about vitamin B. Um, and uh, vitamin B is, is very much a, a, a big a big supplement out there. There's lots of B sources, uh, lots of different companies sell uh, vitamin B and it's used for lots of reasons. Um, but one of the main reasons that it's used is it, it, um, it actually acts as a, um, a protective coating around your body's cells. And so they help preserve the cell, they live longer, they stay healthier, and vitamin B is a, is a really good source for that. This particular question came in because the, the person uh, was having um, uh, reactions, uh, acne reactions, and their doctor told them that vitamin B uh, would increase the testosterone levels in their body because of the way it's, it's manufactured or the way it works in the body, and therefore the hormones change in their body and have, they ha might have an acne response from it. And it, it started her thinking about some things and wanting to know if maybe this might increase, uh, change the testosterone and estrogen balance in her body and might cause some cancers. And uh, apparently the doctor had had mentioned this might be a concern. And so um, I actually studied this in college. This was part of my, my master's research uh, in one piece that I was working on because I, I was doing genetic research. And vitamin B actually um, protects the, uh, the cell, the, the DNA of the cell from breaking down. That's one of its main pieces. And so if you have a healthy cell, 
and you want to preserve the DNA and keep it from, from changing and you would keep it healthier, then vitamin B coats this particular DNA and keeps it from mutating and keeps it from changing. The study that the doctor, I don't, she might have been referencing, but the one study that I actually read through and that I had worked with was in cancer patients, they use vitamin B thinking that it might help um, the healthy cells stay stronger. And basically what it did was it preserved both the cancer cells and the healthy cells. And so it, it had a, almost a limiting effect on the cancer cells and the way they were treating them so that it actually uh, kind of blocked some of the chemo work that they were trying to do to kill these cells off. And so it was then <clears throat> kind of hypothesized that vitamin B might not be very good uh, for cancer patients because it would preserve a cancer cell. So just um, if you have questions like that, I'm, it's, a, it's a big study. There's a lot of information about B vitamin out there. Um, but just, um, just know that as long as you're taking it within a, a suggested range, you should have no problems. Um, my response to the question about the acne was probably just to increase your water amount. That'll help, usually helps clean up uh, the skin. So hopefully that worked out. Um, the last one I want to talk about is I'm not losing weight. What's going wrong? This is a question I got from several of you guys. You're at week, last week was week six, and you're like, look, I'm not doing anything what is wrong with me? And here's my, here's my short answer to this. Stop putting yourself on the scale. Just stop looking at weight. If I could eliminate the word weight from our vocabulary, uh, it just, it, I mean, I, I, I kind of tongue in cheek answer this question when people send it to me and, and kind of try to make light of it. Um, but I really just want to scream. And as I put in one message this week, I just want to throw my hands up and scream. Stop using weight as a measure. I know that as a society, we all want to be a certain weight. God knows my best friend and I talk about this. I just want to be a unicorn. I just want to be 175 pounds and skinny and pretty. That's what, we, and, and, and that's, that's what we say. I just want to be a unicorn. I'm never going to be 175 pounds and healthy. It's just not ever going to happen. And so when I stopped thinking about weight and started thinking about being healthy, then the scales never mattered. And so um, you guys are doing so much work on your body and you're feeding it properly and you're, you're working it out. And when you get your DEXA scans, everybody that has had a DEXA scan either midway through or already, every single person is gaining lean muscle. Every one of them, every single person is gaining lean muscle. And muscle is more dense than fat. And so I don't really care what you weigh. If you're building lean muscle, your body's going to burn fat. And so if you gain five pounds of lean muscle and you lose six pounds of body fat, then you've only lost a pound, but you're still significantly healthier. You've lost five pounds of fat. That's a lot. And so stop thinking about weight. Stop worrying about weight. I know some of you, especially some of you girls, I deal with you girls all the time. You're like, I just want to be skinny. I just want to weigh, whatever. Stop it. Stop talking about weight and let's talk about healthy. Okay. So get off the scales Stop looking at weight and stop worrying about how much you're losing because it's not going to work. If you do it, it means you're going straight back to the diet, and that's not what we're looking for. All right, enough of that. Let's go on to our topic this week, exercise and, met met and metabolism. So in this week, we're going to talk about this. There is so much information on exercise. I mean, good God, you can log on to the internet and find a thousand workouts and a thousand personal trainers and hundreds of, of plans to follow, and it's just like, you know, five minute abs, please. Okay. There's so much crap out there that it's overwhelming. You don't even know what to do. And everybody has an opinion. Go to the gym. I work out at Vita and there are at least 20 guys around me doing the same, uh, working the same body part and everyone's doing it differently. And they think that theirs is the best way or whatever. And so everybody has an opinion. The, the research that that's out there, people are just constantly doing research uh, programs on mechanics of working out. And so the, the information just continues to grow. Um, talking about variables in your diet. How does your diet change? How does this change? How does that change? There's so much going on. There's so theories about exercise methods. Uh, as, a, as a personal trainer, we do uh, continuing education. And it seems like every year, they're like, oh, we've got the best new way. I can't believe we've never done this before. And they teach us some other theory about exercise. When quite honestly, guys, I mean, seriously, some, some, with, with or without weights, just some good old squats and some push-ups and sit-ups. Those things work all your major muscle groups and, and you, you got it. But, um, you know, the research is so difficult also because our lifestyles change over time. We're never the same. You know, five years ago, my life was very different. So how, how, 
how did I work out then versus now? And so there's so many variables in all this. It's so difficult to figure out what's right and what works. So the big question is, is exercise an effective strategy for weight loss? So this, is, this brings about a whole another idea about exercise because I'll tell you why. And the reason this is so important to me is I, I get questions every single day. I have someone email me or text me or Instagram me or something almost every single day that says, um, I, I just need to lose weight, so I'm starting to work out. I'm going back to the gym. And that's all they want to do. They just want me to build a workout program because they want to lose weight. And I, as you guys have already figured out, I take you back to the nutrition part because nutrition is 80% of it. The workout is only 20% of this. And so, so I want to, I want to exercise more to lose weight. Okay. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me because you're probably not eating properly. In fact, just a decade ago, just, just a decade ago, this is what the current research was telling us. Well, okay. Too much food makes us fat. I mean, they're keeping it really simple. Too much food makes us fat. And exercise burns calories. So if we eat too much, we get fat. But since exercise burns calories, therefore exercise just makes us less fat. And that's what we've adopted. We've just, we've just said, you know what, I just need to exercise more because I want to be less fat. And that's all we do. We just go to the gym and we just, we're like, ah, oh, I need to go to the gym, I need to go to the gym, I need to go to the gym because I got to be less fat. Meanwhile, you haven't eaten all day, or maybe you've eaten all day, one or the other. You've done something all day that hasn't prepared you to even go work out, but you got to go work out, for God's sakes, because that's how you're going to be less fat. That's all we've been taught. But guys, this is not true. Hopefully, by now, you've already seen this with our meal plans and how much I beat you guys up about eating. Studies show that people can actually gain weight when they exercise. And some of you guys have already proved that. Some of you guys have already gained weight. You're calling me going, I don't know what's happened. I've gained three pounds, but my pants fit better and my, my, my shirts fit better. Things feel better and I feel better, but I'm gaining weight. Well, we just talked about that, guys. Muscle weighs more than fat. And if you're working out and you're feeding it, guess what? You're going to gain weight. And so I love this little, little picture right here because, guys, this is, this, is not, this is not me, but this is me. This is exactly me. I ran on the treadmill every day like this poor guy right here, and I thought, I just need to run more. I just need to run more. I just need to run more. And I ran more, and I dieted to 300 pounds. And so I'm one of those people who exercised and gained more weight to look like this poor guy right here. So this, this is just such a simplized, oversimplified theory about this. But it's true. This is exactly what we do. So how do we look at this topic differently? We have to look at this thing by asking some questions. Now, first question, does exercise help us lose weight? So you guys know I'm going here because the first thing we got to deal with is the idea of weight. Does it help us lose weight? Well, I hate that word. I wish I could eliminate it from everybody's vocabulary. The minds, the, 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 with shifting the mindset, from an ideal weight to a healthy lifestyle is critical. You got to stop thinking about this ideal weight and think about my lifestyle. How is my lifestyle healthy? So leading a physically active lifestyle is critical for not putting on weight. If I'm leading a healthy, active lifestyle, and I'm talking about all of my lifestyle, I get up in the morning, I feed my body properly, I exercise throughout the day, I take the stairs instead of ride the escalator, I ride my bike whenever I can, I'm eating healthy foods all through the day and snacking and making sure I have my water. I'm going to the gym when I need to. I'm getting ready to sleep. That's a healthy, active lifestyle. That's critical for not putting on weight because I'm actually doing something physical with my body. In fact, regular exercisers become so much more attuned to their body's needs that they reap mental benefits and so much better quality of life because they're so much more in tune to what their body needs. They're not just eating whenever they want or whenever they feel like it and eating whatever's in front of them. They're just, they're actually being in tune with their body and knowing what it needs. Much of this is genetic though. And, and we want to, we want to blame genetics a lot of times. Um, and that's true. I, I will admit it. I come from a family that's, that's heavier, but there are 20 different gene markers that impact the response on physical activity. And so it's, it's not that I'm just predisposed to being fat. It's that my body is predisposed to certain things like how it builds muscle, how it stores body fat, what it does when I work out. Is my body designed to be strong and thick and heavy and bulky or is designed to be lean and fast? 
what is my genetic makeup designed to do? And then, you know, what's kind of the hard part about all that is we kind of have to accept what genes gave us, what our parents gave us. Um, I, I love this. Uh, someone had, had told me one time, they said, um, you know, Michael Jackson, I'm uh, sorry, Michael Jordan, uh, amazing basketball player, one of the best basketball players of all. And I use him because I'm from North Carolina and he's from North Carolina. Um, but Michael Jordan is an amazing basketball player. And yes, Michael Jordan threw that basketball uh, time and time and time and time and time and time again to make himself better. There is no amount of practice and there is no number of times I could throw a basketball into a hoop that I could ever become as good as Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan. I'm just not genetically predisposed to being that type of athlete. So to think that I'm going to sit and practice every day and practice every day and be as good as, can I be, can I be good? Absolutely. I'm never saying someone doesn't have the potential to go and overcome their genetic odds of getting there, but, but that's not something that I'm going to ever aspire to do because I'm just not genetically designed to do that. And so we have to kind of look at it from a little different angle and say, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. Diet and type of exercise play a huge role in the body's response and metabolism, how it repairs and grows and the calories that it needs. Some of us need more calories. Our body type is designed so that it burns calories quicker. And so we can eat more calories. Some people can survive on fewer calories. My body can survive on fewer calories, but I've learned that if I feed it more and I work it harder, then it needs more calories and it gets healthier by doing that. But by nature, it doesn't necessarily need a lot of calories to maintain itself. Much like, uh, unlike one of my really good friends who constantly fights to gain muscle and he can eat anything. His body is just lean and it burns calories like crazy. He's just a different body type. Of course, he complains about not being able to build muscle um, and grow larger. And, and we, we fight over who has the worst problem. Um, and so there's a, a huge research project uh, or collaboration of research projects um, at the Cochrane Institute that uh, what they did was they reviewed 43 different exercise and weight loss studies. Now, these are studies that had no dietary component to them. So 43 different programs. And that's like we're going to do a burpee challenge for, for six weeks and see what happens. And this program is we're running on the treadmill, uh, you know, 30 minutes a day for five days in a row. Um, 43 exercise and weight loss studies that did not have a dietary component. There was no diet prescribed with it. And they determined that the average person in this group, in this, in this particular challenge, the average person only lost two pounds. So exercise programs, 43 of them, designed for weight loss studies and had no dietary component. They did not tell them what to eat. Those people lost two pounds. If they worked intensely, they lost three pounds. So that tells us that, that if you're just using exercise to lose weight without dietary component and not getting the food right, you're going to lose two pounds. Well, I mean, not to be gross, but I mean, I can just either not eat a meal and lose two pounds or, you know, in the morning after I have my coffee and, and visit the bathroom, I'm two pounds lighter. So that's not a lot of work. I'm not a lot of results for the work that they've done. And so we know that this means you have to have food. The food component is so critical. So the real issue is that weight loss is hard. Trust me, guys. I fought it my whole life. But keeping it off is even harder. I work every single day as hard as I've ever worked to maintain my lifestyle now. Now, it gets easier because I know how to do it. And it gets easier because I've journaled so much. That becomes second nature. And it becomes easier because I know the tools but I still work really hard. And the reason is, is our metabolism downshifts through the process. We do all this work and the metabolism is just fighting and fighting and it kicks in the hormones back into the body to encourage it to regain that weight. It wants to get, regain that weight because it loves homeostasis. My body wants to be at a certain body fat percentage more than anything in the world. My body fat percentage really wants to sit around 18%. I really want it to sit around 12%, but it doesn't want to be there. It wants to stay at 18%. And so I have to fight that all the time to just really work hard to keep that down there. But I also realize that, you know, I don't have to be 12% to be happy. I don't have to look a certain way to be happy. If my body is comfortable, as long as I'm healthy, as long as I'm doing everything to maintain my health, then I can hover in that range. And when I really want to look good and go to the beach or, you know, summer's coming on, I can drop my body fat down where I want it and work a little harder for that. 
but I don't have to come from 30 or 36 where I started, 36% body fat from when I started. Now I just have a couple of percentages I have to work with because my body knows how to maintain that. All right, so number two, exercise makes me hungrier. I get this one a lot. People say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna exercise very much because I just get hungrier. I'm gonna wanna eat more. But the real question with this is, is this physiological or is it psychological? See, you know, research concludes that we eat for enjoyment and pleasure. So therefore, we're not conscious about what our body needs to fuel it and repair it. So we've been taught, at least in my family, we eat for enjoyment. We eat because we're around the table with our family. I had dinner with my family every single night growing up. And so that was our family time. And we ate for enjoyment. We had parties where we all eat every single time there was a birthday or anything. We ate. We ate for enjoyment. And so we learn to reward ourselves with food and we learn to enjoy ourselves with food versus listening to our body and what we want. A great example of this is my brand new puppy. You probably heard him crying just a few minutes ago, but he has never been told you can only eat this much food. He's always been in a situation where the food has been there for him to eat what he wants versus my greyhound, the older dog I have, she has been, was raised on a track where she had to fight for the food that she had. And so she eats whatever's in front of her and she eats it very quickly. It doesn't matter how much is there, she's going to eat it. So I have to be very careful because the puppy, his food sits out and he will eat what he wants and he will just eat and graze whenever he wants because he's in tune to what his body needs. He eats what his body needs versus my greyhound who eats because she's just been trained that the food's only going to be there so long and she has to eat. And so we've taught her to eat for survival. We do the same thing. We teach ourselves to eat for, for survival and for enjoyment versus listening to what our body really needs. So research, this is a really good little research project, research on avid athletes and those people who exercise daily. So people who work out all the time, they measured, um, there was no increase in calorie intake on days they exercised versus days they rested. So what this means, guys, remember in your meal plans when I gave it to you, the question came out, one of the first ones was, well, on days I work out, do I need to increase my calories? But I told you guys, especially with my fitness pal, disable, just completely disable the fitness component because it adds calories. It adds calories back in there, and we don't need to do that. So even avid athletes, an athlete who burns, and when we talk about avid, those are people who burn between 500 and 1,000 calories a day working out. An avid athlete doesn't change their diet plan from day to day versus the days they work out when they rest. They eat the same things because their body long-term needs to be maintained. And, and just because you took today off doesn't mean your body doesn't need that food um, to maintain itself and to re continue rebuilding. So uh, keep eating. Don't change, don't change things. Also, I love this one. Vigorous exercise briefly downregulates the appetite stimulation hormone. So when you're working out, the appetite stimulation hormone actually decreases. Your body doesn't want to eat at that point, so it decreases the stimulation hormone. And it rises quickly after we finish working out, but it never goes above where it was originally. So if our appetites, the, the hormones that regulate our appetite, dive down when we work out, we shouldn't be hungry. And they rise back up right after we work out, but they don't go any higher than they were before. So if the hormone levels don't go up, then our appetite shouldn't go up. Like it shouldn't drive us to want to eat more after we work out. So then why am I lightheaded? And why do I feel like I want to eat right after my workout? I get this one every day. I, I, I'm so lightheaded when I work out and I'm starving after I work out. I'm just, just so ravenous after I finish working out. Well, there's an easy answer. Go back to your meal plan. Go back to your meal plan. If you are lightheaded when you work out, it means you did not feel your body properly before you went into the gym. If you are ravenous when you finish your workout, it means your body is starved for proteins trying to rebuild muscles because you didn't fuel it properly to begin with. So if these are the case, if you're lightheaded or you feel hungry during your workout, you're not doing your meal plan properly. That's the only answer. It has nothing to do with the exercise you just did, increasing your body's need for those calories or that your body gets hungry afterwards, it's because you haven't fueled before you went to the gym. So make sure you go back to that meal plan. Um, also, long-term, I love this part, long-term, an increase in muscle due to exercise and proper nutrition leads to an increase in sustainable metabolism along with the net calories needed to fuel the body. 
Therefore, you need to eat more as you gain more muscle. That's what we talked about early on tonight. So as you work out and you're building lean muscle, remember muscle is what burns calories. Muscles burn calories. So if I'm increasing those muscles through exercise and proper nutrition, then the metabolism is going to increase as well because it needs more calories to fuel the body at that point. Therefore, you're going to have to eat more as your body grows. Now, remember back the very first night that we had this conversation, I showed you my pictures, my before picture, my in the middle picture, and then my current picture. And remember, in the middle, I was eating 2,400 calories a day. And I was 174 pounds and I was working out like crazy, like a madman twice a day in the gym. But I was only eating 22 to 2,400 calories. It wasn't until I learned how to eat 4,400 calories a day that my body put on 35 pounds of lean muscle. Like I just blew up. Like I'm a whole different person. But I had to eat. My body was starving at 2,400 calories. It wasn't until I added 2,000 additional calories of food to fuel my body that the muscle just grew. And now I burn calories like crazy because my metabolism has just shot through the roof. So as you fuel your body, and this is why taking those DEXA scans or having a scan to understand your muscle mass is important. As your muscle mass increases, so does the demand for calories. Take home, basically what we just said, food is a habit and a choice in our society. We don't eat what our bodies need, rather we eat for enjoyment and pleasure, making it difficult for most of us to shift our thinking and assess the real answers. So because we don't eat, for survival because we don't eat what our body needs. It's so difficult for us to decide and really assess whether, uh, whether we're making the right choices or not and whether we're fueling enough because we're not listening to our bodies. We're just eating for enjoyment. All right. Cause those are the things that we really want to eat. And guys, I'm no different. I love really good food. I love it. I love good food. I'm not a sweet eater. So the dessert is not for me. But I mean, a steak and potatoes and some pizza and fries, those, those things, those are all right up my alley. I love them. I just understand how they affect my body and what I need to do to have them. But uh, I feel my body based off of its needs because I've learned that. Number three, I've worked really hard. I deserve a reward myself. How do I reserve, deserve, uh, how do I reward myself? This is a really, really good topic because several of you have asked me about this and we've had really good discussions with it. You can, trust me, you can treat yourself and you can do it on occasion. But here's the caveat for this, guys. This can sabotage you like crazy. Now, if you remember my original story, remember I told you in three months, I lost three pounds. And that's because I just did it my way and I just didn't really listen to Brooke's plan. But it wasn't until I followed her program for eight solid weeks, I never deviated. Guys, when I talk about never deviating, I ate the same damn boring thing for eight weeks in a row. Every single day, I cut out alcohol, I cut out sugars, I cut out everything. I did exactly what she told me for eight solid weeks. Was I bored? Was I angry? Was I like awful when, with my friends around? Did I go, I, I didn't go out to the bars or anything because I, I couldn't be around it. I was miserable, truly miserable for eight weeks. But I lost 50 pounds in eight weeks. And at the end of those eight weeks, I had learned so much about my body. And I thought, gosh, eight weeks was nothing. Eight weeks was nothing to me. I could have easily done this at any time in my life. And I didn't treat myself because I didn't want to sabotage it. And I'm so glad I didn't. I'm so glad that I stayed focused. So research shows that treating, and this is why, research shows that treating means that you still see your eating habits as a diet. It means you're still looking at your meal plan as a diet. I'm dieting and I need a treat. And therefore, treats end up being high calorie foods, like the pictures we just saw, meant for enjoyment, and they're usually disproportionate to the activity level that you're performing. Now, that means I'm going to go treat myself tonight and I'm going to eat what I want to eat and I'm going to have fun with it. And you go and you eat 3,000 calories because you ate the whole dang pizza and the pitcher of beer and the bottle of wine. And you're like, I got to treat myself and I did it. Guys, this can be so detrimental to your body chemistry when you're trying your damnedest to get it working. You're trying so hard to get it working where it needs to go and what you're wanting to do. And then you've worked really hard. I'm not saying you're not working hard, but then you go and you just jump off the deep end because you deserve, you deserve a reward for working so hard. I get it. Let's do something different with that reward. Let's not reward ourselves with food. Let's reward ourselves with something else. All right, let's do something different. 
uh, to reward instead of uh, reinforcing that habit that we learn. So this is a great example with this. So I, I, I go running on the treadmill for 40 minutes and I run at a nine, uh, nine mile per minute pace. That burns roughly 550 calories. And I think, yes, I ran for 40 whole minutes. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. I can barely run 40 whole minutes right now anyway. So that's fantastic. And I ran and I got burned calories. And so I'm going to stop by a coffee shop on the way to work and I'm going to grab me a venti mocha frappuccino. All right, well, we already know what that is. That's 800 calories. 80% sugar, 19% fat, 1% something else. So we know that's not a good choice. So it's just completely out of whack with what we just did. We, we treat ourselves because we did it, but we've spent 300 extra calories treating ourselves that we didn't even burn off on the treadmill in the first place. And so um, this little study, I love this little treadmill study. This has been done several times and the results are always the same. I love this one. So what they did was they took people and they put them on a treadmill and um, they didn't put monitors on them. They couldn't see the information on it. And they, they made them walk on the treadmill until they had each burned 300 calories. However long, um, whatever it is, it did not matter. They just, until their monitor showed 300 calories. And again, this person did not know how many calories they burned. They asked them how many calories they thought they had burned in this period of time. And the guess range was from 500 all the way up to 850 calories. So someone walks on a treadmill and burns 300 calories, but in their head, they think they burned 850 calories. Their perceived exertion was 850 calories. Beyond that, they said, okay, you still don't know how many calories you burned, but what we want you to do is we want you to eat a meal that's proportionate to the calories you just burned. So it first makes any assumption they have to know how many calories they burned. So if someone thinks that they burn 700 calories on the treadmill, they then have to go figure out that this particular meal that they might eat was 700 calories, which makes, makes the choice even harder because now you're assuming this person knows what kind of foods values they are, which we know that most people don't. And what they did was their average meal that they consumed was 600 calories. And so not only did they not understand how many calories they were burning, they don't, they're not in tune with their body enough, but they also don't know how to do meals enough to balance that out. So you know, it's just completely out of proportion uh, of what we think our exertion is and then what we're consuming. And so that's one of our big challenges of understanding our bodies, um, you know, our, our bodies as a society. But more research shows that being fit has many uh, effects on the body so that people are just, they want to be healthier. And so just being fit in general uh, increases your exercise levels and, and healthy diet choices and all those kind of things. Um, and so that's the biggest benefit uh, of being healthy and being fit. All right, some simple suggestions that we have here, and we're going to wrap this up. The first one is ramp up your intensity. You guys have two weeks, so this week and next week, left. So ramping up your intensity, this means increasing the intensity burns more calories, but also encourages the metabolism to stay high uh, for up to 14 hours longer. Uh, research will show us that men who cycle for 45 minutes will burn an average of 500 calories, but over the next 12 hours after they do this, their body will continue to burn calories up to around 193 calories. So after they finished working out, their body still continues to burn calories. So ramp up that intensity in a class. Work harder in your class next time. Now your ideal heart rate for burning maximum calories, this means that you're burning calories, burning, uh, maintaining muscle, but burning fat that's between 75 and 80% of your heart max. That's the range that you're really trying to, to hit. And the easiest way to calculate that is 220 minus your current age will tell you what your, your 75 to 80% max range is, okay? Second thing you can do, increase your incidental activities. Now these are the ways that you burn more calories while not working out. These are the things that I, I really encourage people to do. So it shows that active non-exercisers, these are people who just live a an active lifestyle. They don't necessarily go to the gym and work out and run and all those kind of things, but they're just active. They're running errands and they're walking here and they're going to you know, the park with their dog and their kids and things like that. Those people burn more calories than people who actually run 35 miles per week, but lead an otherwise sedentary life at home and office. So they, they, they don't do anything in their life at home and at work other than they run 35 miles a week. So that's five miles a day every day. Other than that, they don't really do anything else. But the people who are just active all the time burn more calories than that. So then studies also show that standing versus sitting burns up to 750 calories per day and doesn't trigger an appetite response. You want to burn more calories? Stop sitting at your desk all day. 
This is the reason that the trend is people getting stand-up desks at work because standing burns more calories than simple things. And these are things that I always focus on. If I'm, if I'm parking somewhere, I'm going to park at the other end of the parking lot and I'm going to walk. Fighting for the closest parking spot means that you're just lazy, period. I, I can't believe it, it drives me crazy to watch people sit at the front of a parking lot and wait for something to open up because they're just too lazy to go out to the parking lot and walk. It's crazy. Take the stairs whenever possible. You know what? I love the metro stations that just have like the stairs. I always use the stairs. Even if the escalator is working, I'm going to walk up the escalator. I'm not just going to stand there idly. Walk or bike everywhere. I mean, we have an advantage living here in the district. If you do live in the district, I walk everywhere. I bike everywhere. Um, I don't drive unless I absolutely have to. And so I'm always more active uh, all the time. Uh, and it reminds me about the people this morning that I met with the lady just didn't want to walk the 15 minutes because she just is too late. I'm sure she's that person who finds the closest parking spot um, to the Walmart when she goes shopping. So, um, you know, that just drives me crazy because she, she could definitely have used some help walking. Um, number three, find ways to make exercise enjoyable. Now, you guys are all in Balance Burn classes, and it sounds like you guys are loving those classes. But you know what? At the end of this, if Balance Burn is not your thing, what is? What, what is another enjoyable exercise that you can do? Is it running or is it uh, a couple of you have talked about um, getting back into running and wanting to know about run clubs and things. Um, swimming, playing volleyball, playing whatever, sports, going to the park and, and, and whatever. Find something that's enjoyable so that you want to exercise, not that you have to exercise. Count calories burned with monitors and phone apps. And so you guys are already counting all your food Let's move this over into my, my poor puppy wants out so badly. Um, let's move over to really starting to monitor our exercise and fitness calories. So wearing and, and, and uh, I, I truly believe that your phone apps uh, used with a heart rate monitor on your chest is the way to go. Don't use um, a Fitbit or something like that. They don't have, they're just not that accurate. Use a, a real monitor, heart rate monitor that burns calories. Don't rely on the hand grips on the treadmills. Um, those things are just uh, generic, um, but have your own personal monitor uh, and really, really uh, calculate your number so that you can get really familiar with what you do. Um, track portion sizes on your meals. You guys should already be doing that, but that's a big one, especially when you go out to eat. Keeping track of those uh, portions are, are incredible. You just can't imagine. Um, in restaurants, uh, I do one series, uh, one training that we talk about restaurant portions. In the average restaurant, serves a portion size that's three times what it should be. And so I think there's even like a, at the Olive Garden or something like that, the chicken Parmesan is actually four servings uh, with the pasta. There's, there's four uh, servings in that bowl and we eat the whole thing. And so we just need to make sure that we're keeping track of portions um, as we work on this. All right, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it for tonight's stuff. And so um, our next steps, make sure, last couple little things, if you're not connected, I think everybody is now connected on my fitness pal. Um, those of you who want, or at least those of you who want to be social media, we're wrapping this up. And after next week, it was our last, uh, our last time that we'll be together here. And so if you still want to follow me and work with me uh, and be, uh, be, be part of, of my healthy community on social media, you're welcome to. Um, I'm nearing 5,000 people in my, in my Facebook, but as long as I can take you out, I'll accept you as a friend. So be sure to do that. Um, however you want to keep tracking, 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 track everything as much as you can. One week left. Where are you on your goals? What do you have to do this next week to really, really push um, to hit those goals? Rewatch this webinar again. Uh, I'll have it posted. I'll try to get it tomorrow. If not, it'll be Thursday morning. So that'll be up. Um, I talked to several of you guys about some private coaching information. Just know that if you're interested in after this, uh, doing some personal coaching, um, I am available. I can help you and, uh, and, and we can talk about that um, privately if you want to do that. So you know what, what those options are. Um, I am getting ready to roll out a new challenge. I've talked about this a couple of times. I've worked out the details. I still don't uh, know. I'm, I'm, Sean and I are not going to be doing something immediately after this. We might run something later on. Um, but I will be running a, a new challenge, and uh, probably um, in the next week, I'll be sending you guys all a, a, an email uh, that will have a link to it, uh, to a private section of my new website that is specifically for you guys, where you will find all the information we've talked about. All these videos will be posted there, um, and a lot of information we posted there for you guys to have access to. And so you should get a, a private email from me 
<clears throat> with some log information uh, in the next uh, week or two on that. Next week topic, we're going to talk about maintenance and long-term wellness. Um, these are going to be topics about how to maintain this program over the time, some, some tips and tools, and also what kind of things you should be looking for in long-term wellness programs, and then wrapping this all up with, uh, with some good tips. And uh, I think that's it for now. So that's everything I've got tonight on here. I'm going to unshare this page and we'll get to some questions for you guys. All right, I'm going to ahead and stop the recording. So for you guys just uh, watching the online video after this, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to stop this so we can get to some questions for those people who joined us. So let me get this done.